Hello again, everybody. It's Lori White with the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce. Hope you're doing well today. This is episode number 169 of Chamber TV. And today we are continuing our discussion with the candidates seeking public office in the second congressional district in Rhode Island. And today we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Omar Barr. Good morning, Dr. Barr. How are you today? Good morning. Thank you, Laurie. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much for creating the time for me. Thank you so much. And we are particularly pleased to have you here. And I want to start out, uh, Dr. Barr, by just reading from your bio because it is so incredibly compelling. I want to make sure that I, I articulate it in one fair, you know, one <laughs> fast swoop so we can sort of dig into it uh, as we go along. But uh, Dr. Barr is a psychologist, author, former journalist, okay, that's uh, a man after my own heart, <laughs> refugee and global survivor leader residing in the United States. He is the founder and executive director of the Refugee Dream Center in Providence. So that is just a snapshot of your Wikipedia profile and description. So with that, I want to say, wow. Tell us about Dr. Barr. Well, thank you, Laurie, once again. Um, well, uh, I am a, a candidate for the second congressional district in Rhode Island, uh, wanting to represent uh, the district in the US Congress. Uh, but my background is that I'm a psychologist uh, focused on uh, trauma and uh, leadership psychology, but also I founded and run a nonprofit called the Refugee Dream Center that um, uh, so serves uh, people who are in vulnerable conditions, uh, mostly refugees, immigrants, and other Americans in getting them out of poverty, getting them to jobs, and speaking English, and mentoring hundreds of youths a year. Um, a former journalist from the Gambia in West Africa, I've been living here for 15 years in Rhode Island. And, and by the way, the funny part is I knew uh, Rhode Island one day before coming here as a refugee. And uh, uh, that is how refugees are resettled in the US. Uh, the government just takes them to different spots. And I learned about the state and I was excited even though with a lot of anxiety and uh, because it is the smaller state and uh, the country I was born in the Gambia is the smallest country on the mainland of Africa. So uh, despite the challenges and anxiety and struggles, it was easy to feel at home, to adjust into American society and to immediately uh, seek and attain the American dream. And then uh, that is why, what motivated me actually to found that center so that I could uh, provide those dreams to everybody and that is actually what is motivating me to run for Congress so that every person in the district, despite your economic level, middle class or working class, will live a dignified life without the struggles in this inflation level and attain that dream without uh, hardship. Yeah. That, uh, that is a beautiful way to express um, the American dream. So tell us a little bit about how that uh, plays out in your day-to-day -day life in your work with the Refugee Set Settlement Center and what kind of um, what kind of issues do you encounter in your work um, relative to trauma? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, it, when I came to this country, I mean to this specific state 15 years ago, I've never left this home and I, I will never leave Rhode Island because that's really home. And I I did not know anybody, no family, no friend, no community. And the people I found here gave me hope and hope and opportunities. They gave me the reason to believe that there was chance for a second life. And uh, there were so many struggles and challenges, but I was uh, uh, framed to work hard and be determined because I was available with opportunities with scholarships and student loans and just get out there and get an education. And um, I realized that trauma, mental health, is a big problem. And I, I then switched to study psychology because I wanted to have the clinical knowledge to counsel and support people. In my career, I've counseled hundreds, if not thousands, of people 
who are uh, refugees, veteran, American veterans of wars, people who are struggling every day to, to function. And then I translated that to the center so that we are doing both a combination of, of services from a holistic perspective. And uh, just working with somebody to get out of uh, poverty, you know, from job training or learning English and getting to a job place and following up to ensure they keep those jobs and uh, going to job trainings or, or community college and uh, or mentoring young people who, event, who most often are very vulnerable because uh, it's very easy for the group that I mentor not to finish high school, not to even go to school. And it is they have a great potential of joining gangs or en engaging in the criminal justice system. So we thought we could do something holistic for people to attain that dream. And that is all, it all revolves around public safety, about around the American dream, around jobs and uh, the economy. And I thought to myself, when the opportunity arrived, what we are doing here, I am able to do it or get at least some impact because I lived it, I live it. And I'm working with people every day who understand, who are going through these kinds of challenges. I work with single mothers who use the child tax credit to be able to pay a babysitter so that they can do two jobs and pay their rent or pay their mortgages. Without the child tax credit, they would not be able to get by. I understand that because I see and work with people every day. When rent relief came, uh, hundreds of people started coming to my office seeking help not because they did not know about it or they did not want it because they did not know how to apply access issues are a big challenge for people across communities in america in this district so i am presenting myself in this election because i know that the things i see every day around the economy around the struggles of the good people of this state and this district can be addressed if somebody who understands their issues, their challenges, and sees it every day, can go to Washington and bring those resources back home. Dr. Dubai, I want to uh, pick up on something you said a moment ago about coming into this country and not knowing a single person and not having anybody or anything with you. What, what was that like in terms of the life that you formerly lived when you were in Africa? Yeah, it was, I mean, it was like, literally, it was like being in a whole new world. And I grew up in a small village in, in the Gambia, in Western Africa. And, you know, it, when we say village in, in Gambia, it's not like saying for taxed village or uh, peace there, like <laughs> Wakefield. It's different. It, it's literally like, uh, a settlement 200 years ago. No running water, no electricity, no um, no school. Um, what else? I mean, no no car, no ambulance, no hospital. Literally, people lived in uh, mud huts, and uh, a few who were uh, affluent had uh, tin roofs. Um, the you know the kinds of roofs when it rains, you hear a lot of sound. And um, so I was. Uh, you have to go to the well to fetch water to put a pan of water or a bucket on your head and walk from back and forth. And, you know, I, I saw my mother work very hard because she was the only woman in the home. And in that culture, the woman does all the domestic work, doing the laundry with her hands, fetching water for everybody, cooking for everybody, cleaning. It was just hard work. So, And I had to walk for miles to school, to another town, with very few kids because most of the kids were not enrolled in school. And certainly not girls, because most of the girls were forced into marriages at teen years, when they are teenagers. And I was motivated to, to struggle, walking to school without shoes, because I wanted to get a job to change that, to, to help my mom, to get people out of poverty, to address those economic issues and social justice issues. And that's why I, I, I am naturally a progressive because those are the issues that I see every day in my life from childhood to now. Issues of social justice, issues of the environment, issues of human rights, thinking of that woman, my mom, when I was a child. And when I came to America, I, I was 
the only thing that settled my anxiety was when I looked at Rhode Island on the map, I saw the size. I said, okay. I thought it's an island, but I mean, it's, uh, it's a state in the United States and um, it is small. So I hope and I am ready to make this feel at home. Uh, and uh, uh, it has certainly been home. Uh, it is very difficult to come and start your life from scratch, from the bottom. Uh, I was a reporter, you know, already started a career until I was 26. And uh, uh, now coming to a new place, having to start everything from bottom. I mean, most people who come to this country usually have communities. You know, there may be Italian community, or the, the, the Liberian community, uh, Indian community. I did not find anybody. There were a few immigrants from the Gambia, but I mean, you remember I was a journalist who was wanted, tortured and forced into exile, escaped the country, and my pictures were pasted on TV. And I did not want to associate with the immigrant community in, in Rhode Island from the Gambia because I, I did just did not trust anybody. It was until a friend told me, look, you are safe. <laughs> you are in America, there's nothing will happen to you. But I was very paranoid and scared and afraid and just did not, just was isolated and lonely. So my first supervisor who lived in the village of Harrisville in Boreville uh, at Rhode Island Housing, literally adopted me like a son. She and her husband and their entire family became my friends. Uh, we used to celebrate Thanksgiving and um, uh, literally everything, ha Halloween and Christmas, all the holidays so that I could understand and learn about American culture. In, in Harrisville. So Harrisville is like a second home to me. And uh, what happened was this family became my new family, taught me American culture. And my first son, who is now 12, is named after the patriarch of the family, Barry. So um, um, this just naturally became home. Despite struggles, I knew there were struggles. And that is those are the struggles that I went through, culture clash, culture shock and issues of access and stigma and, and mental uh, uh, mental health issue, issues. Just, I mean, I did not, I was not even told anything about mental health. I, I did not get any trauma support. That's why I started it, to help others who may be going through these kinds of challenge. So my career became addressing issues from a holistic perspective. I uh, decided to go to school to get a bachelor's degree. Then I got a master's degree, then another master's degree and a doctorate because I wanted to be able to do direct services that had to do with the economy, to get people the jobs, to, to mentor young people, to teach people to integrate into American society, and then eventually to also address issues of mental health and homelessness. Um, uh, my experience working at Rhode Island Housing for five years also helped me to understand the issues of housing and how to create access and, and uh, uh, opportunities. So it's been uh, literally, I, I say to myself, people ask me, what job do you do? I say, I think I have no idea. I think I do literally almost everything. <laughs> I, I founded a, 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 an LLC, a, a small business, by the way, where that I use to train uh, people on cultural attunement and trauma-informed care. So I've trained hundreds of police officers on trauma-informed care, hundreds of doctors and nurses and social workers and uh, also trained teachers. So literally all across the board to understand how to do their work on uh, from a trauma-informed uh, perspective, but also from a cultural achievement uh, approach. What you're speaking of, Dr. Barr, is, is probably very, very, very uh, unimaginable for most people that might be listening to this or listening to your story. Uh, particularly the aspects of how you grew up and no running water and um, assisting a mom who was doing laundry, you know, completely by hand and walking miles to school barefoot. Um, how, how do you relate to or how, how can you, you know, how do you speak to your clients, your new clients and help them to understand what what the trauma of their own lives means compared to you know the trauma that you experienced as a young boy. Yeah, absolutely. So I I use this to to, to motivate people not to dismiss the challenges and struggles because everybody's resilience is unique to themselves. Some people can experience the same thing 
and some succeed or some weather it through and some still struggle. And uh, my hope and uh, my method is to always try to inspire people, especially younger people, who see me as if this kid can come from the same area, whether you are from Syria or Ukraine now or Afghanistan or Congo or Liberia, we probably had very similar upbringing or challenges or struggles. You come to America, the land of opportunities and all this, the amazing, uh, great uh, things that we can achieve just with, with determination and grit. If he can do it, I can be able to do it. Now, my message after declaring myself a candidate in this election is that I'm trying to achieve three things. Three things that motivated me to run. To promote the American dream because I have done it, I've offered it to others, and I want to extend that to everybody given my lived experience. And I want to defend democracy. I mean, I was a journalist, tortured and, and forced into exile because I stood up to a dictator. And uh, after seeing the threats to democracy in our country, I want to ensure that I fight to defend this country that is the only one I have. And uh, I cannot just watch by and, and see things that I can offer and are not taken care of. I work with almost 400 people from Afghanistan. And I know if folks like me were in Congress to help the government, and the, gov the, the regime in Afghanistan that we should have protected wouldn't have followed. And Taliban wouldn't be back by now. And, uh, and, and Putin is threatening uh, civilizations and causing destruction. Uh, millions of people have been displaced. Those are the things that I want to offer to defend democracy, both here but across the world, because of uh, the importance of this democracy here, which is the model of the world and has endured for 250 years. And certainly the third reason why I'm into this is the future. And that comes back to my life, my upbringing and the work that I do right now. The future in the sense that we protect the environment, there's already drought and weather patterns and flooding across the world and here in Rhode Island on our coastline that is under threat. And we need to divest on, 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 on uh, fossil fuels. We need to invest in uh, renewable energies. We also need to invest on early childhood ed education and education in general. Uh, uh, look into student loans because people are, are hurting. I have two people who are helping me with my campaign They're in their late 60s, still cannot retire because they owe student loans that they got over 30 years ago. And I think uh, investing in job trainings and uh, issues of uh, free community college across the uh, country, uh, not only in Rhode Island, would help defend or protect that future. And for me, the future is for a child in that district whether you are in Westerly or in Providence or in Cranston or Butterville, to look at me, just like the kids that I help right now, and say, look, I was born here, like his kids. My kids, 10 and 12. I look at them every day. I say, them, they say to them, I'm doing this for you, for you who were born here, and the American kids who were born here. If a kid who was using a donkey cart to get to a hospital as an ambulance or walk for miles to school, with no shoes or sit on the floor, on a sandy floor or under a mango tree for a classroom, can come here and attain the American dream in terms of education and career. The bottom line is you can do better. If that, for me, that is the feature I want to offer in this uh, race, in, my, in that, this election. And I think that will make a tremendous difference. And how beautiful and amazing would it be for Rhode Island to lead the way. Lead the way by sending the first person of color, the first refugee or black person, black person to Congress to represent the state. It will be an issue of diversity. It will be a great uh, way of bringing voices that are up and not hard, but it will be an opportunity to bring in a different perspective that is often uh, uh, engaged in the spectator syndrome, that uh, it is important for people to talk about or uh, engage in people, issues that matter to them. But it will be a beautiful opportunity for Rhode Island to lead the way that we can do this. And sending the first person of color to represent the state, it will be a great team of four. I have a great deal of respect for everybody on the congressional delegation. I've actually been for over five years on uh, Langevin's uh, diversity committee. 
And uh, I know Jack Reed very well. Senator Reed has helped my wife to reunite with me here when she was literally kidnapped in the Gambia by the dictatorship. He took it off, off as part of his responsibility to ensure my wife was reunited with me. So Rhode Island has done so much for me. Let me help with the future of this state and with the future of this country. Thank you. I want to pick up on um, your experiences as a journalist and a lot of um, you know discussion about protecting democracy. What is the future of democracy in this world? Uh, democracy compared with other parts of the world that, that do not appreciate free speech, the freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, freedom of religion. As a journalist, um, and I'm familiar a little bit with your story, I read about it in the University of Rhode Island Magazine. Tell us uh, just a little bit about some of what you uh, endured as a proponent and what you did to stand up for democracy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, when I see what is happening right now, uh, whether in it is in Afghanistan or, or, or Ukraine, or, or Russia's aggression, or what happened on January 6th, I am agitated and anxious because I think about what happened in my about seven years of experience as a journalist in uh, the Gambia. By the way, it's being the smallest country on the mainland of Africa. The world doesn't often know what was going on there. It was extreme levels of suffering and oppression and uh, tyranny. I stood up. I said I wanted to be a journalist because I wanted to have a voice, give voice to others, but create a platform where people must participate on issues that mattered in their lives. It did not go out, go down well because I was arrested and kidnapped at the military barracks and tortured, uh, uh, tortured means being hit by gun butts and kicked and stabbed with bayonets, uh, military knives. It was literally like a kill uh, exercise. Luckily for me, it was I was arrested in a public place. There was an international outcry, including the CPJ, which is based in New York, uh, Committee to Protect Journalists. Uh, international bodies started talking about it, so I was released. But I was seriously injured, had a lot of wounds that until today, I feel dead, dead skin from some of the wounds that I, I got from that 20, 21 years ago, that torture experience. I continued to work as a journalist. Uh, at some point, the dictator was so brutal that no newspaper would publish my articles. I started writing for an, an American-based paper, and the dictator hacked into it and wanted to know why who, who was writing from the Gambia. And it is when they found out that I was the one writing for that paper, then they declared me a wanted person. Luckily, I was able to flee and escape that country. So I've al al always stood up to uh, injustice. I've always... Uh, stood for social justice and that is what keeps motivating me because I know with my new country where I've been for 15 years and have been a citizen for 10 years now where my children were born I look at them I say look I do not regret being born in the Gambia but I certainly admire you for being born here every time I drop them to school they drive it in a car, go to a beautiful school with great lawns, and uh, they use Apple computers, and they have screens, uh, PowerPoint presentations. And I think of my childhood. I'm grateful. I'm grateful to this country. I'm grateful to the opportunities. And I cannot see what happened in January 6th not happening again if we are complacent. We cannot let Aaron Fong or the Republicans uh, creating a majority in Congress, because that means Trump and his associates will go scot free and they will not be held accountable. And the moment we start to be complacent, that is when democracy can uh, be attacked and be dismantled. And that cannot happen because that is the freedom that we all enjoy. If elected, um, what committee assignments would you seek? in Congress? 
to well, I think some of some of them would be, you know, uh, 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 hard. You know, the, I think the areas of housing uh, is very important for me. So really being able to work with HUD and um, uh, areas of um, uh, healthcare would be very important, and uh, certainly education, because I see, I drive around with so much change in my car, one one dollars or tw- uh, quarters, twenty five do- twenty five cents, uh, because I s- cannot drive past any homeless person without my child having to drop money. If I don't give them money, my kids will complain. They'll say, oh, you told us Gambia, everybody is poor. People don't have food to eat. And you driving past homeless people without giving them food, money. So I always have to have change. And that the, that is not the exercise that I'm trying to share here. What I'm trying to say is that the, that gives me the awareness, sense of awareness of the extreme emergency we have here. People are homeless because they are not taken care of. We have so much money in this country, and I think my expertise in uh, in such committees or subcommittees can help in diverting certain resources that can ensure we address, we have enough housing stock that can address the issue of homelessness, not only in this district, but across the country. I think also mental health is important. It's a great contributor. I um, mean, you see people struggling in the streets, whether it's extremely cold or extremely hot, they are not uh, taken care of because um, there may be uh, mental health challenges that are associated with it. I am, as a psychologist, I understand some of the struggles that can lead into homelessness or that can lead into being unable to keep or maintain a job that can get you housed. Those are things that we must address. I am particularly concerned of the economy. There's a lot of inflation as a small business owner, apart from the Refugee Dream Center, I told you I own Attune and Incline. That is a small business that does trainings and uh, uh, events and, and workshops for organizations, but also for, for experts and police and healthcare workers in culture and, and, and trauma. I see the struggles that small businesses are faced with. So we need to invest in, in, in higher education, especially job trainings, uh, community college uh, certainly is important. So I think there is so much money that can be diverted into this. Healthcare is central in our lives. Uh, my wife is a survivor of uh, cancer. You see, we came to this country and then built a new life. It was really exciting, amazing. And then a couple of years later, we were hit with a whole new challenge. My wife uh, was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer. And one of the primary reasons why that happened when she was almost late is because we we are just not showing up at primary care appointments because of the copies. We just don't want them. And we could not afford them that time. And when she was diagnosed, she was almost late. Luckily, she's okay now. She did all the chemo, radiation therapies. She still has appointments to do certain surgeries, but we are happy and lucky that we it happened in this country because she has been treated and she is uh, going on her normal business now. And uh, if we have uh, healthcare policies where people can be able to afford healthcare and their copies and their prescriptions, we will not be having issues of access or problems like what my wife went through. So I think we must address the issue of affordability and accessibility of healthcare in this country. So those are the areas that I would be happy and readily invested in because I know that will bring resources and address issues of economics right here in this district and also uh, in the state and across the country. Well, we, we've certainly covered a lot of ground and we have two minutes left. Um, uh, and I want to just get back to the issue, your central issue about um, jobs and job creation and job training. Um, what do you, What is your observation, Dr. Barr, on the current state of the job market here in Rhode Island and in the U.S., I guess, in general, given um, everything post-pandemic and the, um, you know, the great resignation, if you will, and how does that square in your own mind with um, what you've experienced um, as a child and also your vision of getting people back to work? So what, what, is, what is a job, what is a good job mean to you and how do you convey that to your students and your clients? Yeah, absolutely. You see, I mean, it, it must be a, a healthy environment. It means 
uh, peaceful and nice and uh, uh, but also importantly well paying you know um we are uh, currently in lacking uh, enough labor in our job markets uh, uh for some reason i mean uh, as i told you i'm working with about 400 people from afghanistan and within a short time they were in because companies and businesses need people to work so we need to create incentives for small businesses so that they can hire and maintain and also keep up with the minimum wage and i think uh, that is those are resources for, uh, the federal government can can bring in to support uh, small businesses in our communities and uh, also larger corporations to be able to understand that when you hire and pay well and people will be able to maintain those jobs and that will trickle down to, into the economy people will be productive members of the society they'll be paying taxes they will own homes they'll rent homes and that all uh, uplifts the economy we have high levels of inflation right now and uh, i mean we cannot have a, a country that uh, where uh, the the cost of uh, a gallon of milk is competing with the uh, federal minimum wage of 7.25 it has to be looked into to, to address a, a good job it means uh, addressing the gas prices if people cannot buy gas to get to work or to take care of their families take them to school and these are the things uh, i'm not reciting um these are things that i struggle through and i see every day because people are, are, are hurting. I mean, every day at the Refugee Dream Center, we give out assistance for uh, heating assistance, electricity assistance, rental assistance, because people need these kinds of resources as hand ups to be able to get by. So my idea is to ensure that we put a strong emphasis on assisting small businesses to be able to maintain a good paying uh, labor force but also ensuring that uh, the federal minimum wage is addressed and address inflation, uh, maybe bring back and extend things like child tax credits and just for people to get by during this inflation period. Also control and uh, uh, examine the uh, corporate world that is seems to be profiting from the Ukraine war by increasing oil prices because that in some way does not only create inflation but makes everybody's life hard. I go to price right or stop and shop three years ago before the pandemic. I used to fill that cart to feed a family of four, including my mom and my sister. It's like five, six people with 200 or 250. Now you spend nothing less than 600 to fill that cart. It is not a, a good environment for people who are working, even those who get that job. So to sum up your question, a good job should be able to make a decent living for that person doing the work. And they should be also in an environment where they are happy and taken care of. Well said, um, absolutely. So as we end, uh, Dr. Barr, um, please let folks know how they can reach out to you, how they can contact you, if they're interested in donating to your campaign or if they're interested in learning more about your background and or some of the issues that you're working on or if they want to contribute. Um, how do we get in touch with you? Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much, Lori. I mean, um, please, uh, for listeners or people watching out there or members of the uh, province chambers of commerce, and you can uh, uh, reach our campaign at www.barforcongress.com and uh, please sign up to volunteer to help us. And then uh, you can also see the donate button. I will certainly make good use of your dollars to invest in this feature because i think this is an hist a historic opportunity to, to 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 send me to congress to to work with you to work for you and uh you can email us through the website and then uh, please get in touch and i certainly need your vote thank you thank you so much dr omar Barr, candidate for the second congressional district in rhode island running as a democrat uh, he brings a compelling personal story with him. And also, uh, Dr. Barr, I want to say that uh, you, you mentioned two words that I think really describe you, and that is someone who is incredibly self-aware and the importance of self-awareness. So we wish you well as you continue on this journey. Uh, good luck in September, and uh, we certainly invite you back anytime that you'd like to come back and 
talk with chamber members about uh, the campaign or anything else uh, that's on your mind or that you're working on uh, with your own constituents and clients and Great. friends and neighbors. So you take good care of yourself and we'll see you again very soon. Thanks. Thank you so much, Gloria. Thank you. I'm grateful.